Coming up on DTNS, NASA helps push development of 3D printed organs, a potential end to all cookie consent pop-ups, and should TikTok get into TV? This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, June 18th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer. On the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And uh, stepping over Len, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. <laughs> Joining us today, best-selling author and co-host of the AI Effect and Sirius XM show, The Feed, Amber Back is back. Welcome back, Amber. Hey, guys. It's so nice to see you. It's been way too long. I know, I know. We were just having a good conversation about uh, plant identification apps, uh, among many other things. If you want that wider conversation, get our expanded show, Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Reuters reports it's seen an official notice from police in the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh summoning Twitter India head Manish Maheshwari to answer allegations that Twitter failed to stop the spread of a violent video of several reportedly Hindu men attacking a reportedly Muslim man. India's federal government is currently in a bit of a battle with Twitter over its non-compliance with new IT rules that became effective in late May. Spotify acquired the podcast discovery service Pods, with a Z, P-O-D-Z. The startup offers an audio news feed of podcasts presenting 60-second clips from various shows using machine learning to give potential listeners a taste of a podcast's vibe before they subscribe. On Wednesday, Spotify debuted Green Room, its live audio clubhouse rival. So lots of, lots of new stuff coming to Spotify. A joint operation from law enforcement agencies in Ukraine, South Korea, and the United States has resulted in the arrests of six suspects believed to be involved in the Klopp ransomware gang. The suspects are accused of running a double extortion scheme where victims are threatened with leak of data that's stolen from their networks prior to their files being encrypted if they don't pay up first. Ukraine's Cyber Police Department of the National Police confirms it searched 21 residences in the capital, Kiev, and nearby regions, also seized equipment and cash said to be behind total financial damages of about $500 million. News agency Xinhua reports that the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, or ICBC, and the Agricultural Bank of China, or ABC, uh, now lets customers exchange the country's new central bank digital currency for fiat currency at more than 3,000 ATMs in Beijing. ICBC is reportedly the country's first bank to add full support for withdrawals and deposits of the digital yuan, known as DCEP. CBDC is a state-controlled digital equivalent of physical currency, but the DCEP is programmable money and not based on a blockchain. A lot of acronyms there. Yeah, it's still I know. kind of exciting. 1,263 cybersecurity professionals from the U.S., the U.K., Spain, Germany, France, United Arab Emirates, and Singapore took part in the Cyber Reason Global Ransomware Study to measure impact on businesses following a ransomware attack. The study found that 66% of businesses reported loss of revenue. 53% reported damage to the brand, 29% had unplanned workforce reductions, and 25% resulted in closure of the business altogether. Cyber Reason's study also found that 80% of organizations that did pay the ransoms got hit with subsequent ransomware attacks, and about half of those subsequent attacks were by the same actors. All right, let's talk a little more about some of these stories. Uh, starting, Sarah, tell us uh, what XDA found. XDA developers found code in the latest Google Play Services beta SDK that indicates Google's developing a Find My Device network using Play Services. Two code strings describe the service called Find My Device Network with the description, allows your phone to help locate you and other people's devices, your and other people's devices. It's just an APK reference, so it doesn't guarantee it's ever going to be released, just that Google has at least made a placeholder title and written a description for it. Google also has a Find My Device app in the Play Store, but it only finds devices that are signed into your Google account, so this would be taking it some step further. But XDA points out that there are more than 3 billion devices running Android, the majority of which are phones, meaning Google's Find My Network has the potential to be quite comprehensive should it roll out. Yeah, uh, I, I think this is a no-brainer uh, for Google to do. It's it's a little harder to go for Google to do because they don't control the entire ecosystem like Apple. But but Amber, would would you be excited about something that, like this coming to your phone? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, our whole family are Android users. So I love this idea. I especially love that you don't have to be signed into your Google service. Uh, for example, my son's not a big uh, Google services user, but he does have an Android device. So I see how this makes sense in the larger context in terms of making it easier to be able to find your devices. So to be honest with you, when I read this, I kind of think I'm surprised they haven't developed this already, right? <laughs> you know, it seems like something that we would have had before 2021. And uh, I know a lot of Android users will absolutely love it. Yeah, I look at I the thought... uh, Apple ecosystem and I realize that they could put it in because they're like, we know we have the chip and every phone that we have out there has the chip now. So it's easy to implement. Whereas Google has to have some more checks and balances to be like, well, wait a minute, this one doesn't maybe have the whole hardware. So how do we message that? How do we handle that? Yeah, I mean, I know in just the article too, a lot of people are just want to make sure that you can opt out of it, right? Because as soon as we talk about tracking anything, there's obviously privacy concerns that go along with it. Uh, so I think that's another consideration is just uh, hopefully, you know, you, you can opt out easily and uh, not have to worry about uh, being opted in by default. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, uh, the research firm Nielsen announced a new streaming TV metric called The Gauge that monitors a willing participant's router to determine exactly what they're streaming. So what did it find? In May 2021, U.S. viewers spent 26% of TV viewing time on streaming services. That is up from 14% a couple of years ago in 2019. It was up from 20% last year, even in the midst of lockdown. Nielsen estimates that will rise to 33% by the end of 2021. Netflix and YouTube were the top streamers out of all of that, each getting about 6% of TV viewing, with all the other streamers at 3% or less. Even Disney Plus only had 1%. This would seem to indicate that it's not too late for a new entrant into the streaming game. You still got a lot of eyeballs that have yet to move over, but it does look like they're moving over. So enter TikTok. TikTok? Yes, yes, I just said TikTok. Protocol notes that TikTok has been experimenting with smart TV platforms. The first app was more on TikTok. That came out for Amazon's Fire TVs a year ago. Just had curated popular videos, though. In December, TikTok launched an app for Samsung smart TVs, followed by an Android TV app in February. Those apps are available in select European countries. They still have the curated collections, but they also let you log in and see your personal feeds. Others have walked this trail of going from social mobile to TV before, not all of them successes. May I remind you of Quibi? Uh, <laughs> though its videos have done surprisingly well for Roku, from May 20th to June 3rd, more Roku accounts streamed former Quibi content than Quibi got in its entire existence. Uh, two apps that are still there, Twitter and Facebook, they both have smart TV apps for multiple platforms, but I don't think anybody considers them wild successes. There's also the success story though, YouTube. Uh, more than 120 million people watched YouTube on a TV in the U.S. in December. So, Amber, you're going to watch some TikTok on your TV? I, I am uh, pretty skeptical of the future of this, to be honest with you. So if I think about how people watch TikTok, it's such a personal experience, right? And and also there's uh, so much involved in terms of kind of swiping to the next video. And it, it's very intimate and, and something you do kind of on your own and in a space where uh, you don't just sit back and relax and grab some popcorn and watch TikTok videos. So to me, it just feels like, uh, again, this is a play to try to take something that's incredibly popular and make it make sense on a smart TV. But I just don't see it actually being something that really has legs. Uh, I feel as though TikTok is just a really good mobile experience, and I just cannot imagine it going really beyond that. You know what's funny about that, Amber? I have a friend who sends me TikTok videos. It's like the way that we text each other now. It's just like, here's one you'll like, and there's almost no other conversation happening. But uh, I had mentioned to him something about like, I don't know that like tr make sure you watch this one on your computer, not your phone, something like that. And he was like, what do you mean? He did not realize that there was a desktop version of TikTok where you log in and your account's the same. And sure, they're, you know, it's maybe a slightly different experience, but I'm like, oh yeah, I never watched any TikToks on my phone, you know, because I'm sitting at my computer anyway. It's, it's an easier way for me to lose an hour or two. So I feel like I might be the target market for the TV. I don't know, yeah, how much that would be a group activity, right? Because your for you page is, you gotta log in, it's all, it's all about your account. So would you really do that in a group scenario with a bunch of people around a TV? I don't know, maybe. But I also thought that the, you know, Quibi, Quibi failure as, as its own platform 
but the content sort of living on on Roku is a great example of, you know, Quibi should have just been a content arm of Roku to begin with, you know, build, build something where there's a lot of great original content within a platform that's that exists and is thriving. That's how you get people to watch everything instead of having to die first. Yeah, I also think too, there, there's a physicality again, if I go back to the whole TikTok experience that you don't get with some of these other services like Quibi. I mean, Quibi, when it launched, it did have sort of longer series. I mean, long in the mobile sense. Uh, so I, I do think it makes sense within Roku. Uh, but uh, again, I still wonder about that physicality of TikTok and how you you want it kind of close. So I, I just, I would not bet on this one, I think, um, especially with the next generation. And, and also, you know, do they even have smart TVs in their homes? or in their bedrooms, it's not something that is all that common. Yeah, I, I I wouldn't say it's impossible for something from TikTok to be popular on TV because TikTok is so wide ranging. Everybody's TikTok experience is different. You know, I, I think of TikTok in regards to like funny Korean videos and food, whereas other people think of it as travel and other people think of it as skateboard videos and, and there, it, it's all different. So there, there could be a niche where that works. I have no idea what that niche is, uh, and I'm not guaranteeing it, but that's the, on that's the only thing that might make it worth the bet of like, hey, let's try this and see if it catches on. But it's not something where I can look at it and go, oh yeah, obviously that's, that's something that's gonna work. Cause it does seem like it really is just built for a direct interactive experience with people even Although wanting to, to use the camera to respond and, and you don't have a camera usually on your TV. Mm, that's true. It'll be interesting to see yeah, what the evolution of TikTok is to support the larger format experiences, because it wasn't that many years ago that I felt the same way about YouTube. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not even, even if you could, you know, I could maybe airplay a YouTube video to my TV. It's like, eh, what's the point? You know, it's YouTube. It's different. It's not like long form content that I use my TV for. And now anything that's more than a couple of minutes. Yeah. I watch on my TV. I don't want to watch it on my computer. Well, you, some people have the choice. Some people don't, but 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 it it really depends on you know what is TikTok offering me if it's some longer form content and yeah a little bit less of like oh uh, you know a, a trendy dance meme and more of a, a reoccurring series of sorts then yeah I might want to uh, absorb it the way I absorb lots of other episodic content. Uh, before we proceed, Sarah, I need you to accept these cookies. <laughs> oh, fine. <laughs> Fine, because I want to read the rest of the article. Geez, stop bugging me. If you're tired of being asked about cookies when you go pretty much anywhere that's a publication of some kind on the internet, well, the privacy-oriented groups Sustainable Computing Lab and None of Your Business, that's actually the name of the group, have proposed a new HTTP standard that would respect privacy settings set inside the browser and then communicate those preferences to every website. Extensions like Consent-O-Matic... Tom was singing its praisers to me earlier today, already try to do this now, and they do fairly well. But a standard could make it work smoothly for everybody. The proposed standard is called Advanced Data Protection Control. It offers two methods of communication privacy preferences. One would have a server hosting a JSON file referenced in the HTTP headers of a site. The other would use JavaScript in the website to pass an object to the DOM interface, D-O-M. But either way, privacy preferences stored in the browser are sent as a list of what you do and what, what you don't consent to. The server version is more efficient, but it requires modifications to the web server, while the JavaScript version is easier for websites to implement. Users would still be able to set preferences by site if they want, but this could be a more consistent and less fatiguing way of managing those preferences. I love this idea because... It, it it's, it, it, I feel like my experience is different and I go to lots of, oh, you've never been here before websites, just kind of how the internet works. And I often, I, I know that I'm clicking yes too easily because I do have fatigue about it. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, it's really interesting. I hosted an event recently that was with a bunch of senior brand managers and marketers about our cookie-less future. And it was fascinating to see how that group of executives is trying to navigate this future where perhaps we don't have cookies at all. And one of the things that they said, which I thought was fascinating, is that when it comes to customers and cookies, what happens with cookies is that it actually leads to an, an erosion of trust when people are shopping because they feel as though they're being spied on 
on, even though they don't really articulate it. And so what's happening in the consumer world, especially in, in retail or e-commerce is one example, is now they have to rebuild trust that has been lost through some of these experiences that have helped them do a lot but it's kind of a lazy approach to targeting people. So I, I thought it was just neat to think about the effect that this has on advertising and marketing in general and how significant it's going to be. Yeah, it, this kind of thing, uh, should it catch on, could dr just drive cookies away. Uh, I, I think that's a really interesting point. It could, could mean that marketers realize that that's just not the way to do this because I use Consentomatic as as Sarah uh, mentioned earlier, uh, and I forget I have it on until I use a browser on another machine or I use a, a browser that I haven't installed it on because I've got so many different kinds of browsers and I and then I see like oh my gosh this is what it's like for if you're not using this because what Consentomatic does is it it takes your preferences and it attempts to try to automatically answer when you load a site. It works more than 90% of the time to the point that you don't even know it's there. It's just automatically going, no, 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 just just the the stuff you need. Uh, and and it's it's like, how do you live like this when I go to another browser? Because it's like, oh, I have to acknowledge, okay. And that, that usually happens to me on mobile. If that became default in the browsers, granted you have to have the websites uh, playing along with this, it would be a better experience for everybody. I think it would be a better experience on the web rather than having to manage all those pop-ups and everything. But it would probably mean the end of cookies. I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, our, our cookie-less future, um, again, I think it means that uh, advertisers and marketers need to work that much harder to be able to figure out how to build relationships. And uh, I just think also the next generation of consumers is much more tech savvy in terms of their privacy. So there's just a bunch of things happening. It's almost like a perfect storm where you will see uh, perhaps, like you say, a, a cookie-less future uh, in the months or, or years ahead. And, and I don't think that's such a bad thing. Yeah, we've gone from a, a world where we're like, why doesn't anyone care about their privacy to people almost caring too much about their privacy, which I think is preferable, to be honest. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If another person asked me, said they they think everything's listening to them because they're getting served up ads, <laughs> it will uh, be a, it's kind of a daily occurrence. I'm sure you guys get it, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, all next week uh, will be Accessibility Week. Don't forget, uh, each day we're featuring a guest that will come on to talk about accessibility and technology from testing products to developing UI starting on Monday, June 21st. Don't miss it. Tell your friends. DailyTechNewsShow.com. <laughs> During a video conference interview at Viva Tech in Paris, Apple CEO Tim Cook talked about a range of topics. They addressed taxes, data privacy, climate change, the things you probably already hear Apple talk about in all different sorts of places. But Cook also mentioned that Apple often develops products and then decides not to release them. Let's, let's actually hear an expert of what he said. I, I fail daily at something. Uh, and yes, we do, we do allow ourselves to fail. We, we try to fail internally instead of externally because we don't want to involve customers in the failure. But, but we uh, develop things and, and subsequently decide not to ship. We, uh, we begin uh, going down a certain road and sometimes adjust significantly because of the discovery that we make in that process. And so absolutely, uh, failing is a part of life. And uh, it, it's a, a, a part of whether, whether you're a new company, a startup, or, or you're a, a company that's been around for a while and you're trying different things. If you're not failing, you're not trying enough different things. You should get that whole interview over at Brut, B-R-U-T. That, that's the French publication that was doing the interview. Uh, but I found it interesting. The part about failing, I, I feel like, yeah, I've heard that from tech executives before. But the part about developing things and then just being like, no, we're not going to ship it. Uh, I, I think that's interesting. Do you think that Apple's mindset, I'm not doubting that that's their mindset, ends up with them having fewer failures in public or... Or do you think that whatever they're saying they do, you, you see just as many glitches and, and, and things with, with Apple products out there as you do with anything else? Uh, I'll be honest with you. When I first read this article, my first reaction was sort of that this is 
a position of privilege, right? I would also like to just constantly fail in my private life, but unfortunately I have to go out and work in the real world. And so <laughs> my reaction really was that um, I think we would all like this. If we all had the money that a giant uh, tech company like Apple had, we would all do this. We would try different things and it would not have consequences. But I don't think that that is something that can be carried over into the real world, especially when we're talking about technology startups that are bootstrapping and don't have a lot of cash. So, you know, it's nice to hear it sounds big and grand, uh, but is it practical advice for the average tech entrepreneur? I would say probably not. I think Apple's, you know, Apple's sort of its own, you know, sp special beast, whether you're a fan of the company or not. But I do think that, and, and many companies are all companies, you know, that are competitors to Apple on any scale are going to be having internal failures and say, yeah, this product isn't quite ready yet. Of course, that's not that's not unique to Apple. However, Apple is often accused of, you know, ripping off something that a competitor has had out for, you know, eons. I mean, just think of all the Android examples, you know, we could list, you know, and it's a long list, right? And and, you know, Apple fans will say, well, you know, Apple likes to perfect its product. It doesn't want to be first. It doesn't want to rush something to market. That said, it is often seen as a company that's playing catch up with a lot of new technology. And I think some other companies might say, you know, it's a little bit of that. You don't have to be right as long as you're first, because then you can correct it later. But you were still first. Uh, I think that there might be more of a exciting momentum mentality that Apple simply cannot afford to be because what they at least can ride on their laurels on, uh, you know, even if it's even if not everybody agrees, is that uh, they take the time to get it right. Yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, I, I think what Apple does probably means they avoid some failures, but there's 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 some things that you just you won't know if it's going to fail until you test it at scale. And that's just something you can't do internally. You you got to put it out there in the real world and and have a lot of people using it. Uh, I mean, what about that? You're holding it wrong. And yeah, tentative. right. Yeah. You know, exactly. I mean, it's not like Apple didn't test that internally. They just didn't mm -hmm. realize enough people would hold it wrong. They just had uh, they had a sample bias of people who held it right. And, and also, I mean, if you really think about technology of the future and design of the future, I mean, I don't necessarily just want such a small data set of people deciding on what's going to work. I think you're right. You have to kind of get it out there into the marketplace. Um, would I trust that, hey, if just Apple was, you know, coming up with a product idea internally that they would always know if it was going to be perfect? I, I agree with you. I don't, I don't know if they have that magic power. Well, this story is... Pretty interesting. MIT Technology Review has a story up called NASA Inches Closer to Printing Artificial Organs in Space. Yes, that's really the headline. Last week, NASA named two winning teams in its vascular tissue challenge that required teams to create human organ tissue that could survive for 30 days. The Winston and W. Firm teams from Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine both used 3D printing to grow liver tissue. The liver is one of the most complex organs to replicate. One team used tubular structures to develop blood and nutrients to the tissue, to deliver it rather, and the other created spongier tissue structures to achieve the same thing. Winston, which won first place out of the two, will get to send its research to the International Space Station. The research, of course, has implications for organ transplants on Earth, but NASA is involved because it would be it would like to be able to create organ transplants if necessary for astronauts on long-term missions. You're all the way up there. You need an organ transplant. You know, it's a good place to have it. And the lack of gravity makes that even more challenging than it is on the ground. Eugene Boland, the chief scientist at TechShot, which made the biofabrication facility, which is actually on the ISS back in 2019 says that printing on Earth is like printing with Play-Doh. Printing in space is like printing with honey. Mm. So it's hard. I know. <laughs> Either way, 3D printed organs are getting as close to commercialization on Earth as it is in heaven. Uh, this is this is fascinating because this we always talk. Uh, we don't always, but we often talk about the technologies developed for space having benefits on the ground. Uh, and this is probably one of the could be one of the greatest examples of that, where they they need to be able to print you a new organ when you're on the moon base and you don't have to, you know time to get back to Earth for your transplant. Uh, but that means we have the ability to print you a new liver down here on Earth. That that's incredible. 
Yeah, I thought it was fascinating. To be honest with you, I read it a couple times before I really saw that line because I was trying to figure out why they were trying to do this in space first. Uh, but then it makes sense, like Sarah said, that it's really about those future long deep space missions. So thinking that uh, astronauts are going to be gone for months or years at a time. So in that context, it's fascinating. I mean, you know, this is the stuff that I just, you know, it's, it's magical, right? And it's, it's phenomenal to think about what can be done in those possibilities. And just imagine a world where we could successfully do this. It would just be... Uh, f a phenomenal uh, innovation. Yeah, I was yeah. with you, Amber, when I first read it. I was like, do we not have room to make organs <laughs> in, on Earth? I mean, maybe we don't. I don't know enough about it. But yeah, it's like, okay, <laughs> you got an astronaut up there. They can't just, you know, come on back down to, you know, the, the local hospital and get a procedure done. And then, of course, looking, you know, way ahead in the future, you know, colonization, people living up there all the time, you got to have this, these sorts of capabilities. And if it's that much harder to achieve off of Earth, and it's possible, then you know we're really getting somewhere. Yeah. Someday after a hard night out on Mars, you'll just print yourself a new kidney the next day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Well, before you have to do that, you you might enjoy uh, a new product from Bandai. Bandai announced the Tamagotchi Smart, a watch with a virtual pet that includes a touchscreen to pet the creature, microphone to talk to the creature, pedometer to make sure you're giving it enough exercise because you know it's walking along with you, mm -hmm. get it? As well as wireless connectivity so you can interact with other Tamagotchi because you don't want it to be lonely and you need it to socialize. The watch will first be available through a lottery in Japan and then available in the country November 23rd for 7,480 yen, that's around 68 US dollars, with extra content available through small physical smart keys for 1,100 yen. I think this is cute. I mean, I, I oh, think cute. that... Yeah, people will like this. I mean, I love that there's those fitness elements uh, built in in terms of the pedometer. I think we have a bit of a crisis as well as we think about the next generation in terms of their physical activity, especially with so many months of virtual school and screen time and all those things. So I think for younger kids, I think this could be really fun and really cute and they would probably absolutely love it. Anything to kind of get them moving around and, you know, if they have a virtual pet who encourages them to do so, uh, probably more powerful than a parent. <laughs> Everything 90s is back. That, that's what that's what I see when I see this. Like it's all coming back. We're gonna get digital pogs any day now. Just keep an eye out. It's gonna happen. It, it is true. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I actually, uh, I'm watching Stranger Things again with my son, and I know that's more of the 80s, but uh, it's funny because I'm watching that and I'm thinking some of the fashion's probably back even today. So yeah, right. Old, it's new again. All right, let's check out yeah. the mailbag. Let's do it. Charlie had some thoughts on Google's big new fancy retail store in New York City. Charlie says, I haven't been there yet, but it's in the list of things it might be nice to do today. I can't comment on the Google store itself, but this Google store is two blocks from the Apple store in the Chelsea neighborhood of New York City, so it's walkable. Three blocks from the Samsung showroom. That's like the one that Tom visited in Japan, where you see a bunch of products, you don't necessarily buy them, but you understand a lot more about them when you leave. Charlie says, and it's all adjacent to the High Line. Anyone who's not familiar with the High Line, it's tourist attraction where you can kind of walk in this elevated uh, pathway above the city. Charlie says, get all your tech in one place that way. Yeah, and it's uh, right by the Chelsea Market, so you can get some artisan donuts and some high-end meats, and then go go uh, fuel up for your, your visits to all the tech stores. Buy yourself a Pixel phone. Take pictures yeah. of your food. Do you see? It's perfect. Yeah. Uh, if you have if you have thoughts or questions or comments or I don't know, maybe you want to print an organ in space and would like to tell us more about it, all of those thoughts can go back to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Thank you in advance. We expect to come back to the office on Monday with a lot of emails of your personal stories. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including at Dale McKay, Scott Hepburn, and Bjorn Andre. Also, thanks to our brand new boss, Luke, who's now backing us on Patreon. Luke, Luke, Thank Luke, you, Luke. Luke. Luke Good Luke, to Luke, see you. Luke, Luke, Luke. Welcome back, Luke. Luke. You're the best. Luke. All right. Uh, thanks to Len Peralta, who has also been uh, illustrating during the show today. Len, what have you drawn for us this week? Well, you know, every once in a while, I get to cross the streams between uh, DTNS and my, uh, my life as a tabletop game artist. Uh, and I thought I had an opportunity to do that with this one. I really, really was taken by the TikTok story. And uh, this one's called Rock the Talk. 
And uh, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's an homage to the game Munchkin, uh, which I am uh, uh, tangentially a part of as an artist. And sadly, uh, the Munchkins are, at Steve Jackson Games, Andrew Hackard, a good friend of mine, passed away yesterday. So I wanted to do something in honor of not only the, the cool TikTok uh, thing that's coming up, but also Andrew who uh, was a really, really good friend of mine. Awesome. So if you want to see a closer version of Rock the Talk, you can go to my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Len, or you can look at it at my online store at lenperaltastore.com. So check wow, it out. That's really good, Len. Thanks for Thank doing you. that. That's awesome. Thank you. Good work as always, Len. Ooh, <laughs> voice cracked a little bit. I was so touched. Uh, thanks also to Amber Mack for being with us. Amber and I have not been on a show together in a really long time, although she is a regular guest on here on DTNS. Amber, what else do you have going on? Uh, yeah, just uh, been doing my weekly show, The Feed, on Sirius XM, doing lots of virtual speaking, which I'm loving, and uh, you know, just uh, creating content uh, all around technology and innovation. And uh, definitely missing our time together, Sarah. But uh, I don't know mm -hmm. if you remember way back when, um, every time I would sneeze on the show, someone would make a montage. Um, well, that person is still doing that. So thankfully <laughs> for this show, uh, we will not have me sneezing on air. <laughs> well, you know, I can always throw some red chili <laughs> flakes your way on your Shine next appearance light, and give, give them some some Twitter fodder again. Uh, well, so good to have you. So good to see you. Uh, reminder to everybody, we are live Monday through Friday on this here show, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC is our live time. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And reminder, we are back on Monday kicking off Accessibility Week. Our first guest is Shelly Brisbane. Have a great weekend. Talk to you soon. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nicole Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, and Jack Shid. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A, Acast, and Creative Vast Arts. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor, Patreon support from Stefan Brown. Contributors for this week's show include Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Jen Cutter. Guests on this week's show included Christian Cantrell and Amber Mack. Live art performed by Len Peralta. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. Thank you.